it's Mundo Monday. Is the weather too hot where you are? Come visit the top of my head. The Arctic. You could also visit the Antarctic, which is under my shirt. My two poles receive light from the sun at an angle, so it's not as strong or as warm in those places as it is in other parts of the world. Antarctica, at my South Pole, is an entire continent, and scientists come there from other countries around the world to live for months at a time. But no one ever built a civilization there except penguins. At my North Pole, on the other hand, there is no land, but around the edges and on the ice, many people have built societies based on hunting and fishing the large animals of the North. And like all people, they have told stories. And all across the far North, people especially like stories about giants. Maybe it's because their animals are so big. Maybe it's all the lumpy rock formations and mountains. In fact, many Arctic and subarctic mountains are rumored to be sleeping giants. At the back of our first story, On the Shoulder of a Giant, author Neil Christopher explains. One of the reasons we no longer see giants could be that they are sleeping. Sometimes when the great giants get tired, they fall into a very deep sleep. And when great giants sleep deeply, it can take centuries before they wake up. Elders have said that while great giants are sleeping, dirt and gravel can settle on them and plants and lichens can start growing all over them. Imagine such a person waking up. Even if they are friendly, they would still be overwhelming. So this is the story of On the Shoulder of a Giant an Inuit folktale. The Inuit live along the north coast of North America. Neil Christopher, the retailer of this story, started a publishing company called Inhabit Media. It's a publisher dedicated to telling Inuit stories. And this is the first one he decided to tell, particularly because he says, because of all the giant stories. On the shoulder of a giant, an Inuit folktale, retold by Neil Christopher, illustrated by Jim Nelson. From old stories passed forward from generation to generation, we know that long ago there lived a giant called Inupak. Inupak was huge, even for a giant. He was so tall he could stride over the widest rivers and wade through the deepest lakes. Look at all the little caribou down there, tiny. When Inupak decided to travel, he could walk from one end of the Arctic to the other in just a few days. When he arrived at a coast, he would wade far out into the sea to hunt for whales. Even if he walked out very far, the seawater would never come up past his knees. One day, Inupak met a hunter out on the tundra. See him there. Inupak thought the little man looked friendly and he did not want to frighten him. So Inupak crouched down very low and began to talk to the little person. Little child, why are you out here without your parents? Are you lost? Inupak said in his friendliest voice. Well, the hunter was terrified. He'd never seen a giant before, and he did not understand why the giant had referred to him as a child, as he was an adult. But before the hunter could say anything or run away, Inupak lifted the man up and put him on his shoulder. Don't worry, little son. I will look after you and bring you with me on my walk. And before the hunter could say a word, Inupak started walking. The hunter did not want to go on a walk. But what could he say to a giant? Very soon, they were so far away from where they had started that the hunter did not know where they were or how to get home. The hunter looked around for anything he could recognize, but everything looked strange. Eventually, the hunter saw a lake so big that he could not see the other side. In fact, it was not a lake at all. 
it was the sea. The hunter lived inland, and he'd never seen the sea before, so he did not recognize it for what it was. Inipek took the hunter off his shoulder and held him close to his face so they could talk. I am going to catch a sculpin for us to eat, the giant said. But I don't think I should bring you into the water with me. You are too small, and if you fall into the water, I might not be able to find you. I've never had a little son before, and I don't want to lose you. The hunter wanted to explain to Inipak that he was not a child, and that he did not need anyone to adopt him. But what could he say? He was so far away from where he lived, and he was not sure how to get home. So the hunter decided he should not upset Inupek, and he just said, Okay. Inupek put the hunter on a pile of rocks, and then waded far out into the sea. The man watched the giant stand motionless in the water for some time. Suddenly, Inupek plunged his hand into the sea and pulled out a huge whale. I got a sculpin! I got a sculpin! Inupek yelled. Inupek came running back to the beach, and his quick steps caused a huge wave to form. The little hunter tried to get out of the way, but the water was too fast, and he was covered by the huge wave. When Inupek got back to the beach, he looked around, but did not see his little son. Little son! Little son! Where are you hiding? Inupek called. Eventually, Inupek noticed the little hunter lying in a big puddle of salt water. Inupik laughed and said, There you are. You should not have played in the wave. Now your caribou clothing is soaked. But don't worry, I have got a sculpin, so we will sleep with full bellies tonight. The hunter wanted to tell the giant that he had not been playing in the water. They also wanted to explain to Inupik that he'd caught a bowhead whale, not a sculpin. But once again, the little hunter did not want to argue with a giant. So he just said, Okay. Inupek began cutting up the whale, and the hunter looked for a sunny place to spread out his clothing to dry. Suddenly the hunter saw a huge, what's that, polar bear coming toward him. Inupek! Inupek! The hunter yelled, There's a polar bear! A polar bear! Inupek jumped to his feet and looked in the direction of where his little son was pointing. Inupek loved hunting bears, and he'd not seen one in many years, but he could not see any polar bears in the area. Uh, where is the polar bear, little son? Inupek asked. Polar bears are very large, and I do not see any around. The polar bear was coming closer and closer to the hunter, and he was getting nervous. The hunter pointed at the bear and yelled to the giant, The polar bear is right there! When Inupek saw what the hunter was pointing at, the giant laughed and picked up the bear with two fingers. The polar bear growled and scratched the giant's hand, but this just made the giant laugh harder. When Inupex finally stopped laughing, he said to his son, This is not a polar bear. This is a baby fox or a lemming. It is much too small to be a polar bear. The hunter once again did not know what to say. How could he argue with a giant? Inupek tossed the polar bear far into the sea and sat down to eat his sculpin, which was really a bowhead whale. After eating all he could, Inupek lay down on the tundra, stared up at the sky. He took off his steel skin boots and placed them on the ground beside him. Good night, little son. You can sleep in my boot. It will keep you dry if it rains. Then Inupek yawned and fell asleep. Hunter sat inside the boot and thought about his day. He had started out looking for caribou on the tundra, and now he was the son of a giant by the sea coast. The hunter thought about running away, but he didn't know where he was or how to get home. The giant seemed kind, so the hunter decided to stay with him again and travel with him. In time, the giant and the hunter became good friends and the two of them traveled all across the north and had many adventures together. And that is why, in every region of the Arctic, you can find stories about a huge giant who adopted a human.
In the back of the book, as Mundo pointed out, Christopher has lots more information about Arctic giants. When you study giants, he says, it's important to identify what kind of giants you're talking about. You might choose to categorize the various giants by their behavior, such as friendly giants or cruel giants, etc., or some other characteristics. Obviously, Inupek is a friendly giant. However, I usually start by identifying a giant's size. In traditional Inuit stories, there are two terms that you can use to categorize giants in this way. The largest giants are called Inukpasujji, or the Great Giants. The story you just read is about a great giant. These giants are the size of mountains and they are incredibly powerful. They are so large they do not see the world as we do. A huge animal like a bowhead whale might seem like a little fish to these great giants. They do not usually bother with humans much because we are small and insignificant to the great giants. There is also a category of smaller giants called Inugarula Jatsujijure. They have a very long name, but they are actually the lesser giants. These giants are about two or three times the size of adult humans. Some lesser giants look very much like humans, and others have a strange appearance, like an ogre or a troll. They are very strong, and some of them are kind and helpful, but most of them are dangerous and cruel. It does here. There are very few great giants left in the world, and that is probably a good thing as they can knock down mountains or cause tidal waves by accident. These great giants usually live alone, as they often do not get along with each other. So in the rare instances when they do encounter one another, it usually ends in a terrible fight. It is said that in the remote regions of the high arctic there live great wind giants. The male wind giants are huge, powerful, and cruel. It is said that the cold arctic winds and storms originate in the land of the northern wind giants. If a traveler mistakenly arrives in the land of the wind giants, these huge beings will hurl boulders at the visitor as they do not like to be disturbed. You know, the old Norse who come from Scandinavia and whose Viking warriors conquered much of the North Atlantic had similar stories about different kinds of giants. The main types were frost giants and fire giants. These giants could appear as great giants. They say the whole world was created from the body of great giant Emir or lesser giants or regular sized people. Not because they actually were these sizes, but because they were masters of illusion. Thor, the god of thunder, made it his duty to keep these dangerous giants out of Midgard, where regular humans live. You may have heard of Thor. He is often portrayed as a great hero, since he protects humans from giants with his mighty hammer, Yonir. But to be honest, Thor could also be mean, violent, and a little bit dumb. Here is a story about how Thor's faults led him to be tricked by a clever group of giants. This story about Thor and the giants is in a much longer book called A Treasury of Norse Mythology, Stories of Intrigue, Trickery, Love, and Revenge, collected by Donna Jo Napoli, with illustrations by Christina Ballet. Because it is a long anthology, it's a, a book with not all that many pictures. So I will show you some pictures, but I will mostly be talking directly to you. It'll be more of a storytelling session. This story is called Thor the Greedy. The more Thor thought about giants, the more he wanted to kill them. He was obsessed. So one morning he said he'd head east on a killing spree. A giant killing spree. And when Loki, the god of mischief and trickery, wanted to come along, Thor agreed. 
Theirs was a twisted alliance. They set out in a goat-drawn chariot and spent the full day traveling across Midgard. That's the, the land of the humans. Come evening, they stopped at a humble farm and asked for room and board. And they ended up taking the children there, the boy Fjalfi and the, his sister Roskba, as their servants for the trip. So Thor and Loki and the boy Fjalfi and his sister Roska set out on foot till they reached the seashore. They stepped in an open strand. In the morning, they found an old boat and crossed the waters into Utgard, which surrounded the stronghold of the giants in Jotunheim. Jotunheim's the land of the giants. Then Thjalfi ran ahead, scouting, and found an enormous hall and a pine glade for them to sleep in. In the middle of the night, however, they woke to a great trembling underfoot. The whole earth roared. Thor was sure it was an earthquake, but no sooner had he said that than it stopped. Still, they didn't feel safe staying where they were, so they explored the grand hall and found a side room where the three of them entered. Thor stood guard at the doorway with Mjolnir at the ready. But no one slept, really. How could they with the roaring returning intermittently as it did? Dread sat like mud in their mouths. In the morning, Thor crept outside and saw a giant sleep. This was a bigger giant than any Thor had ever known before. The giant snored. Ah, the source of the roars. As Thor stood there, the giant woke. Thor was so surprised he didn't kill him, but instead acted sensible and asked who he was. Screamir, said the giant, and he asked if Thor and his crew had moved his glove. Instantly, Thor understood. The enormous hall they'd slept in was really Screamir's glove, and the side room was the thumb part. Amazing. Screamir offered to share food. Then he accompanied them on their journey. But his strides were so long and so fast the others were soon left behind and didn't catch up with him until nightfall, when he'd stopped to sleep. Again, he let them raid his knapsack for food, but he fell asleep as they did so. Thor and Loki and Thjalfi and Roskba wrestled with the knot on that sack, but they couldn't open it. Thor became convinced that this was exactly what Skrymir had intended. In his too typical fury, he slammed the giant on the forehead with Mjolnir. The hammer broke the skin. The giant woke. What leaf fell on my head? Yikes. Mjolnir had barely wounded the giant, much less killed him. The four snuck away and worried half the night. But Screamer's snoring irritated Thor so much that he went back and slammed Mjolnir with all his might against the giant's forehead again. The giant woke. Did an acorn fall on my head? Yikes. Double yikes. <clears throat> but this giant didn't seem threatening. Not really. So near dawn, Thor tiptoed back and swung Mjolnir harder than ever into the giant's temple. The giant woke. Bird droppings, they must have fallen onto my head. Now he saw Thor. Gather your party and go home. The folk ahead are much larger than me. Then Screamir took a sack and marched north into the mountains. But Thor and his companions persisted through the forest until they came to a high gate. They forced their way between the bars and entered a huge hall where giants lolled on benches and leered at them. The giant king said he knew this puny thing before him was the god Thor, and he challenged the travelers to display a skill. Loki took up the challenge. I can eat faster than anyone, he said. So a giant named Logi sat at the opposite of a wooden trencher in front of them. Servants filled with food, and Loki and Logi ate their way toward each other. But Logi, the giant, ate not only the food, but the bones and the trencher as well. He won. 
Who's next? said the giant king. The elf, he said, Oh, I can run faster than anyone. So a small guy named Yugi, um, a giant, but small for a giant, raced Yelfi, and Yugi easily won. They raced three times, and Yugi won three times. And you, Thor? asked the giant king. I can drink more than anyone, said Thor. Quite a boast, said the giant king. He gave Thor a horn to drain. Thor took an enormous drop, but much still remained in the horn. He took a second drop, and a third. It was though the horn had a rising tide. Bah! said Thor. Give me a second task, anything. Boast away, will you? The giant king challenged Thor to pick up his cat. Thor tugged on the cat, but its paws stayed on the ground even as its back stretched and arched higher and higher. Thor pushed himself under the cat and heaved himself upward. The most that moved was a single paw. Bah! Thor screamed. I want a third challenge. Someone wrestle with me. The giants laughed. Only the old giantess Ellie hobbled forward. She dropped her walking stick. Shameful to fight an old woman. But Thor was eager to clear his name, so he lunged at her. She stood firm. He persisted. She brought him to his knees. Enough, said the giant king. Let's feast and then rest. And so all ate and drank themselves silly and slept in the huge hall. And the giant king showed a generosity that Thor couldn't fathom. The next day, Thor and his companions left. The giant king accompanied them out of the forest. Thor was chagrined that he'd failed and feared the giant king would badmouth him to everyone. But the giant king explained that he'd cast a spell on them. All that had happened was partly illusion. The giant king was, in fact, the giant Skrimir. And if Thor's hammer had hit its mark, it would have killed him. The giant Logi, who won the eating contest against Loki and consumed even the trencher, was really wildfire. The giant Hugi, who won the race against Thialfi, was really the giant king's thoughts. The horn that Thor couldn't drain had its bottom in the sea. The cat he couldn't lift was the serpent, Jormungand, who circled Midgard and bit his own tail. And Eli was old age itself. So Thor and his companions had, in fact, done very well in these challenges and proven themselves worthy. But don't come back, said the giant king. I used magic to vanquish you this time, and I'll use it again. I'll protect Utgard however I must. Amazing. This giant was far better at deception than even Loki. In anger at having been tricked, Thor raised his hammer. But the giant king had already vanished. Thor chased after him, ready to crush the huge hall with Mjolnir. But the hall had also vanished. So Thor went back home, stopping by the farm to get his two goats, but keeping the kids as servants. He was a greedy god. Mercy meant nothing to him. The end. Ah you think Thor learned his lesson about mindlessly killing every giant he would meet? I am coming to get you, giants! Maybe not. Keep cool!